After a bronze medal performance in Tokyo, Justin Fongsavon, one of the best javelin throwers in the world, is aiming for gold in Paris. All right, Justin, so you, you got the throw late today, but you got your throws in. Are you satisfied with your performance? Yeah, it's, it's still early in the year. It's March. Um, so given the where I'm, I threw today, we're, we're sitting pretty good for coming in to the trials in July and also the Paralympic Games in late August. Have you already secured your standard? My standard is I, I, I am on the national team currently. Um, the standard is always a reoccurring goal. That's the benchmark of every competition we go to is what we compete against. So I am on the national team uh, all the way until the middle of the year and I'll re keep re-hitting it in most meets. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the, the throwing apparatus or the, the, the throwing frame. Um, how is it, first of all, that you got involved with the javelin over anything else? You got the two other throwing discipline, disciplines being uh, both the disc and the shot put, but you gravitated toward this. Why, why jab? Yeah, so before my injury in high school, I threw shot put and discus because that's all we had in high school sports in Iowa. Um, so when I ultimately be became a disabled athlete, I tried all of them. I tried shot put, discus, javelin. But the one sport that I never did before my injury was javelin. And so when I started throwing it, I was like, this is fun. This is cool. I feel dangerous. And when you see a good javelin fly, it's sexy. It's, it's, it's a beautiful sight to see. And I found an awesome coach that was able, that's a specialist in javelin because she's a 96 Olympian in javelin. And from there, I just decided to make it my bread and butter. So with the success, you've had to, you know, make many adaptions. I'm sure the very first time you threw a jab, you're probably just sitting in your chair. But now you have this uh, specially designed frame. Uh, was that an instant leap in terms of, you know, distance that you could throw by, by getting a frame? Yeah, so what's actually crazy is um, the NASCAR engineer for the roll cages helped me manufacture this chair. And the first meet I had this new chair with me, I broke the world record. That was the difference that it made was it added about three meters to my throw and pushed me into uh, a league that no other thrower in my category has ever gone to. And that's because of the chair. So that being other throwing frames that, that are available out there, is there something unique or special about this one? It's, it's all about the how the forces are distributed through the chair. Every chair, is reinforced in a square usually and the forces want to make the chair bend it's strapped down but it, the chair wants to bend this one it sends the forces through a single point and it reflects it back so there's not as much flex in the chair along with a stiffer pole it makes in more anchor points so everything so the chair is able to strap down harder the chair in itself is stiffer the thing i hold on to is more rigid so it just makes every throw send all the forces through the jab. So the specifications, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this logically going, it, there has to be a specific height because if you get, you know, someone sat up higher and higher, the traje trajectory gets higher. Correct. So uh, are there specific parameters surrounding the building of the frame? Correct. Yeah, there's a, there's height requirements. So the chair can only be so tall that everyone has to do. Um, I can't remember the exact centimeters, but that's pretty much the rule with the actual engineering of the chair is just the height um, then when it comes down to like the nitty-gritty rules like um, how much flex is in the pole is allowable and um, the shape of it has to be a square okay so holding the pole i mean this is pretty obvious that most of the throwing sports when you watch people do it that are not in a wheelchair it uses a lot of torque and 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 thrust from uh you know the torso so essentially you're replacing that by by gripping the pole and and getting your maximum throw yeah correct I don't, i'm a t2 paraplegic complete injury so i'm paralyzed from the sternum down so there is no core function this acts as my leverage to put me my body in a position like my abs would without the pole so i'm able to pull up like doing a sit up forward and sending more power through the javelin there's multiple levers now in this throwing frame, so instead of using my feet, I sit down, and instead of using my abs, I pull. I have to imagine this is not your first throwing frame. How many have you had? Oh, I wanna say I've probably sampled and destroyed, dismantled probably five different chairs. I'm just trying to get the right feel from me, but my first ever throwing chair I had for years. 
um, because it was the only one I knew and it was it made it so I made my first national team and later on it paved the way so the first beginner chair it, it really changed everything but as I got more mature in my sport and I started getting a little bit better um, stronger then that's when I had to go to a custom chair so like just with all the other apparatus we see out there on the track the you know the amputee legs the carbon fiber legs the racing wheelchairs all of this stuff is not cheap so how much would a frame be custom made custom made frame depends on the uh the, the labor parts the most expensive uh, materials is a pretty fixed cost you can figure out how much material is going to be based on how much the steel weighs and that kind of stuff the labor is where it gets expensive so a custom chair would probably run you around four or five thousand um, dollars comparatively to a beginner chair which is around twenty five hundred it's same material but there's just not as much going on in it as an athlete what specific types of things do you work on regularly I mean, you must have a weight program and and other various things stretching programs to keep your shoulder healthy right. talk a little bit about what it is that you do to stay fit and and how you get better yeah i think honestly so the the workouts are sent to me from my my strength and conditioning coach gustavo out of chula vista he sends me all of my workouts my Throwing workouts are sent to me by my coach, Erica Wheeler. Um, I'm able to utilize the resources given to me by the USOPC for mental health services and also insurance needs for if there's any in injuries or anything. But I think where the success comes from in becoming a better athlete is not being so drowned in getting better. It's about having a balance. So outside of sports, I do other things because sports are only going to take up a quarter, quarter of my day. But what am I going to do with the rest of my day? Yeah, I'm stretching. Yeah, I'm doing what I need to, my diet, everything. But I balance it. So because I've graduated college, I've moved on to being an entrepreneur. I have businesses. I have sponsors for engagements and everything like that. So I have friends. And I take, make sure to always get done what I need to do. My stretching, my working out, all my stuff to be an elite athlete. But then I'm also supplementing in happiness, exposure, communication, and making relationships. Coaching has to be important too, because they could probably, your coach can probably see those specific things where maybe you're off in a certain way. Maybe you're not sitting a proper way. Maybe you're overextending or, thro or throwing too hard or not hitting the right kind of marks and places in, in, in your, you know, your throw. Yeah. So uh, talk a little bit about your training and, uh, and how it benefits you to throw further. Yeah, my, my coach is a godsend. She is absolutely incredible. She's When I first met her, I was throwing 2801. And then two and a half years later, we broke the world record at 33 meters. So that that's what the difference was, was a throwing chair and a coach. Um, and just the coaching aspect of the actual going from amateur to, mature, or amateur to professional was what made that transition easier. Uh, because if I had to do it alone, like most of us athletes have to do until we go to college or do something, um, it would have taken me a lot of years to figure it out if I even could have. So as you as you start to approach that that point where you're getting to the upper echelon, Paralympics, you know, you're now you're 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 thrown against other guys that are that are within just a meter of you or maybe even less. How do you prepare yourself mentally? when you get to that level to, to compete against the best in the world? Yeah, uh, first and foremost, I put my faith in God. Um, but when it comes down to being in that stadium, under those lights, the jab in my hand and the pressure's on, I trust in myself. That's, it's me versus me out there. I have a mark that I need to compete against, which is whatever first place is. And if I'm in second, that's what I want to go to but I trust in myself. I trust in my coaching. I trust in everything that I've done that led me up to that opportunity. And from there, I let the jazz fly and the distance speaks for themselves. Okay, so so Justin, you have six attempts as you, you know, you step out there and you're ready to go. You're up, at, you're up in your frame. Um, do you focus on one throw or another? I mean, do you try and get your best throw in right away? or do you sort of lead yourself up to a point where you feel like you're hitting your stride and this is gonna be the one? It's a great question. So seated, seated throws is a little bit different because we aren't able to speak to our coaches in between throws. There is no communication. 
it is just you and you have seven minutes to get all of your throws done. So between each throw is one minute. So when I go out, I always have a game plan. Either it's how my body's feeling, what's the weather like, am I analyzing the wind, is the platform that I'm on secure, where am I at? The warm up throws is usually when I'm going through the motions and I'm feeling what I'm doing. I watch the javelin and I'm able to self-diagnose what's going on based on how the javelin's flying or how my body's feeling. So those first couple throws, I always, I don't like to say take it easy because I'm bringing intensity, but I'm deducing. I'm seeing what's going on. That's usually one, two, three, four. I'm starting to step it up. I'm fixing these what needs to be fixed and I'm sending it through five, six. I should be locked in and we're bringing the, we're bringing the heat.